and it's your old pal Spoons. And these are my sprues. So, this is the very first build video of the Sprues with Spoons YouTube channel. And for this video, I decided to pick Tamiya's 172nd scale, the Haviland Mosquito. This is an awesome little kit released in about 1999. Um, this is their 172nd scale series. They started shrinking down a lot of their 48 scale kits um, to the one true scale, some would say. In this kit, you get the Fighter Bomber Mark VI or the Night Fighter Mark II. So you get two really cool options in here. I thought I'd pick the Mosquito because it's quite arguably one of the best planes of the Second World War. It's really remarkable what it could do. It was fast, it was a heavy hitter, it could fly far, um, and it really did it all. Uh, it was, as it says here, it was a fighter bomber, so close, close air support. It was a night fighter escorting British bombers into the Reich. It was photo reconnaissance. It did uh, coastal command actions, such as anti-shipping and anti-submarine actions, as I did up here. It flew for all the Commonwealth services in almost every theater of the world. War, it was truly a workhorse. Uh, the fun fact about this plane, when de Havilland designed it, they wanted it to be light and fast, and also they wanted to save on aluminum. So what they did was, they built it out of wood. That's, that's a fact. 80% of this plane is made of wood. It's not much different than the planes that flew a generation before in the Great War. Um, basically, they took a kite, strapped two Merlin Rolls-Royce engines to it, and oh yeah, it could carry 4,000 pounds of ordnance. Um, just an incredible aircraft. And the nickname that the British pilots gave it was the Wooden Wonder, which is a great name for this plane. The Germans also had a name for it. They call it Nachschreck, which translates to Night Terror. And there's a fun little story about that I'll share for you later on in the video. But uh, without further ado, let's get into it. This is the Wooden Wonder. Okay, so the first steps in this kit are going to have you assemble the engine nacelles and the wings. Now, there are three different versions of aircraft in this kit. So, you want to peruse the instructions and decide which one you would like to make so you can make the pop modifications to the parts before you start assembling anything. I decided to go with the Coastal Command version, so I'm going to drill out the hard points for the eight 60-pound rockets that are going to be slung under the wings. Make sure you test it, test fit any major parts. You make sure they go together well. There's no cleanup or modification you have to do. It's a Tamiya kit, so it pretty much goes without saying, but it's a good habit to have because not all kits are made the same. I like to use Tamiya's extra thin quick setting cement on big parts like this. It's got a lot of bite, and like it says on the bottle, it goes down quick. So there's not a whole lot of crimping or pinching or squishing you got to do to get the seams to set up really nicely. Painting the wheel wells, I started with AK's acrylic black primer. I really like this stuff. It went down really well. I used it on most of the aircraft. The interior of the well wheels are going to be silver, so I used AK's third generation acrylic silver, thinned it down with their thinner. And the interior color is a pale green on RAF aircraft, so I found this old bottle of testers model master i had sitting around and i thought hey testers went out of business so might as well give them one last hurrah i thinned the paint to a milky consistency i found that it laid down really even and it sprayed very smooth the nacelle and the wing parts fit great it's to me i almost didn't even need glue for this part The interior parts of this kit were painted the same pale green color. I made sure to clean up the connecting points for each parts. That way, plastic will be glued to plastic and not paint to paint. Um, if you don't clean them up, you won't get a good connection, and you're going to have a bad time. One of my favorite stories about the Mosquito happened on January 30th, 1943. This was the date of the 10th anniversary of Hitler's rise to power. Now. Since 1943 wasn't a particularly good year for the Germans during the Second World War, they decided to raise everybody's morale 
by throwing Hitler a big old parade, and Hermann Goring was going to give a speech about it. The British, being the cheeky bastards that they were, found out about this little parade, and they were going to rain on it, literally. Hermann Goring was the man at the beginning of the war who said not one Allied bomb would fall on Germany, and boy was he wrong. Now, the British planned it so precisely that they would arrive over Berlin at the exact same time Hermann Goring was planning to go on the radio. The timing was so precise, in fact, that over the radio, you could hear the engines of the Mosquitoes and the anti-aircraft fire from German batteries trying to bring them down. Their target was Berlin's Haas des Rudfunks, the headquarter building of the German state broadcasting company. They hit the building on the mark, and they literally knocked Goring off the air. One of the most extraordinary and hilarious missions of the Second World War. The cockpit controls were painted with Tamiya's XF-69, nice, NATO black. Using Tamiya XF-56 metallic gray, I dry brushed the instruments and radio equipment. This technique helps highlight the detail on the specific parts and simulates a wear and tear effect on the metal instruments. To pick out specific instrument detail, I used Tamiya's XF-3 flat yellow, XF-7 flat red, XF-2 flat white, and Model Master's Pale Green. Tamiya's X-22 Clear was used to simulate the glass faces of the control panel dials. It's a super cool effect that you won't see once the canopy goes on, but I think it looks pretty sick, so I'm going to do it anyway. After all these parts are painted and detailed, I fasten them in, in place using super glue. The front firewall with the instrument panel is designed in such a way that it clicks into place and holds fast without the use of glue. This is due to Tamiya's exceptional engineering standards. The kit provides seatbelt decals, which is a nice touch. I dip the decals in a warm water solution with a few drops of vinegar, which helps release them from the backing paper. The cockpit was sprayed with Mission Models Gloss Clear to give the decals a smooth surface to adhere to. I fixed them in place using Tamiya's Mark Fit Strong.
I used to me as black panel liner to create depth in the cockpit detail as well as giving it a worn look. This is another benefit to the gloss coat as it gives the panel liner a smooth surface to flow over easily. The excess was cleaned up with a cotton swab and I sealed the final touches in with Mission Models flat clear coat. And the Mosquito has a good enough canopy to where you will be able to see a lot of this cool detail. Really happy with how this turned out. And I'm just going to reattach the control panel to the rest of the cockpit here, this time with the gun sight attached. Another benefit to having a modular design, that way you could leave the small details off like that and not ruin them when you're detailing and painting the cockpit. And there you have it. Pretty sick little cockpit there. Unlike the Americans, the British Bomber Command conducted their bombing raids of Germany at night, which forced the Luftwaffe to develop their own radar-equipped night fighters to hunt down the Lancaster bombers. To counteract this, the British implemented their own night fighters. This is a role that the Mosquito excelled at, equipped with four 303 machine guns in the nose and four 20 millimeter cannons in the barrel. It was a formidable force to come up against in the night skies over the Third Reich. The Mosquitoes were fitted with a device called the Surrette, which could detect the German night fighters from their own radar emissions, allowing them to sneak up behind them and shoot them out of the sky. The Mosquito night fighters would account for 278 total destroyed aircraft. In addition to that, there was a number of German fighters that crashed while trying to make emergency landings to avoid mosquitoes, real or imagined. Not only were mosquitoes equipped with some of the best technology to hunt down the fighters and the weaponry to effectively eliminate them, they also created a psychological factor on the German pilots. The mere rumor of a mosquito being in the combat area was so terrifying that German pilots would scramble back to their airfields and crash land their own planes. By the end of the war, German night fighter pilots said they suffered from a case of what they called mosquito Schreck or mosquito terror.
The landing gear was probably the most difficult part of this entire build. The wheels came in two halves, so I had to sand those down and rescribe some of the tread detail. The tires were painted XF85 rubber black from Tamiya, and then the gear itself was just painted the AK silver third generation acrylic paint. There's five parts in total, including the wheel. So you get two landing gear struts, um, this small, this middle brace type structure. I'm not quite sure what that's called. And then there's like, uh, I guess you'd call that a fender or a mud guard or something. It goes over the top there. This is another good example of test fitting. When you encounter intricate parts like this, you want to make sure you know how they're going to go in before you commit to gluing them. And then I decided to use super glue for these parts. Uh, two reasons. One, they're already painted. And super glue on painted parts works better than Tamiya cement. And also that everything goes into place immediately and locks into place and stays there. So super glue helps all the parts set up really solid and really stiff. So you're not dealing with any fiddliness, if you will. So the structure all kind of forms together immediately in a really firm bond and you don't have to worry about it coming apart or waiting for it to set up too long. That's what I found. That's why I took that approach. Even though the fit was really well, there was still a seam that went down the middle of the fuselage that, would have not, that wouldn't have been there on the actual aircraft. So I made sure to sand this down. I put another pass of Tamiya's extra thin cement over it to help blend the plastic together. And then I had to use some of Vallejo's white putty filler on some sections as well. I made sure to sand with the contour of the aircraft so I wouldn't create a flat spot on top of the fuselage. Some detail was lost during the sanding process, so I went back over it with my Tamiya panel line scriber and rescribed the detail. Masking the canopy is the part that all aircraft modelers dread. I went ahead and bought Ed Edwards pre-cut canopy masks for this particular kit and they come in clutch. You can mask on your own with different sorts of masking tapes, but if you have the money, get a masking set because they just make your life a million times easier.
Canopies can be the most intimidating part of building aircraft. Super glues and solvents like Tamiya's thin cement will cause fogging. So be careful when you're applying them. Here I use the capillary effect and I'm just adding little drops of glue and letting it run through the seam where the frame of the canopy and the fuselage join. If you're too intimidated by that, I suggest using like Elmer's white glue. It dries clear and it's easy to clean up if you make any mistakes. I painted the frame of the canopy with the same Model Masters pale green, so it would have the same interior color. And then the whole aircraft was painted in AK's acrylic black primer. This particular aircraft is a dark sea gray and what Tamiya calls out a deck tan underneath, so I used Tamiya's XF55 deck tan to paint the underside of the aircraft. And when you paint, just build up in layers. Don't lay it all down at once. For the top side of the aircraft, I used Vallejo's Extra Dark Sea Gray, and I got this from their Air War Color Series. They are different paint sets that cover different nationalities, different camo schemes from all sorts of time periods from, I think, World War I to modern, and the sets are comprised of their model air paint, so the paints are thinned and ready to go. All you got to do is drop them in the airbrush and shoot them onto the model. I think they go down really smooth and really well. I forgot to film the exterior decals, but the principle is the same as in the cockpit. I laid down mission models, gloss clear all over the aircraft to give a smooth surface for the decals. And then I used Mark Fit Strong to help them settle into the surface detail. Now, to me, decals are known for being thick. So a way to alleviate this problem was I applied two more coats of gloss clear over the decal used a 3000 grit sanding sponge and then sanded it smooth to where it was blended into the surface of the aircraft better. So now it has a really cool painted on look. I begin the weathering process with the panel lines. I used Payne's gray oil paint, slightly thinned and odorless thinners. And I went around the aircraft and picked out all the surface detail such as panel lines and access hatches. This technique really helps the surface detail pop. It adds more depth to the model and it also creates a cool grimy effect so it looks a little more dirty and used. Once the oil paint was dried or slightly dried, I used a paper towel slightly dampened with odorless spirits and wiping front to back, I created it. I cleaned it off by creating a streaking motion in the direction of the airflow over the aircraft. Um, the other benefit to using oil paints, I find using oil paint in this manner is it almost creates a filter on top of the original paint job so you get a little more depth and a little more variation in the color of the aircraft. It's almost like a three-in-one process. And I repeated this process on the other side of the aircraft. Uh, this is a good example of how a panel line wash really helps the detail pop. There's a lot more detail on the bottom of this aircraft. And you can see the variation of the deck tan and the paint's gray. It gives it a lot. It gives it a really cool worn look. the panel lines were finished i used raw umber and picked out specific points of the aircraft such as maintenance hatches and engine covers to simulate the buildup of grease grime and fuel stains i dropped a flat brush and in the same streaking motion as i did with the panel lines i pulled the oil paint from front to back in the direction of the airflow to create realistic streaking grime on the airframe
simulate the exhaust stains. This was my first time using oil paints for this particular effect. In the past, I would have used powder pigments, which are a lot harder to control. Oil paints can be controlled better and if necessary, removed completely with odorless spirits. In the same streaky motion that I did for the panel line and the oil and grimes, I pulled the exhaust stains back across the engine nacelles and over the wings in the direction of the airflow, creating a more realistic effect. Doing some Googling, I found a picture of the aircraft I intended to build, and it was a very dirty bird. Using burnt umber, titanium white, and Payne's gray, I added more streaking and grime to the aircraft. It also created different tonal variations in the paint. Fighters and bombers of the Second World War saw combat in many different environments around the globe, so modelers have some pretty sweet options when it comes to weathering. This aircraft would have flown out of Scotland, where it would have been wet, windy, and muddy. On top of that, they would have spent a lot of time flying over the ocean. The salt sea spray would have taken its toll on the surface of the aircraft. Take a look at the wings or engine of the next plane you fly on. It won't be as grimy as a military aircraft, but you will notice how dirty they can get. To the finishing touches. The rockets came in two parts. The rockets and rails were molded as one and the tail fins were separate. I airbrushed the rails deck tan then masked them off. The rockets were airbrushed with MIGS Schwartz grown or black green. I went back and did touch-ups by hand and painted the warheads NATO black. There were eight in total. The propellers were painted NATO black while the spinners were given a white base coat and sprayed flat yellow. I dry brushed the spinners and propellers Vallejo's aluminum to simulate wear and tear. 
After the rockets and propellers were attached, I sprayed the model with mission model paints flat clear, building up several dust coats until I achieved the finish I wanted. The best part of any aircraft build is unmasking the canopy. Using a fresh number 11 blade, I scored the edges of the mask to create a cleaner separation from the canopy so I would not damage the paint on the frame. I did some small touch-ups and that's all she wrote. There it is. To me, it's one seventy-second scale De Havilland Mosquito Mark VI fighter bomber. An awesome kit and an awesome scale. Highly recommended. Go pick this up if you're into seventy-second scale aircraft. It's a really fun time. It's to me, everything goes together great. So there's not a whole lot of fuss to the finish, and it's a really enjoyable build. This is the first the, the first build video of Spruce with Spoons. It took me a while because the learning curve of fil filming things was pretty steep. You know, recording, editing, and all that stuff and how I want to sequence the videos. But uh, please stay tuned. I have so many more projects and ideas and topics I want to share with you guys. And this is how ultimately we're going to get to the hobby shop. So hobby shop or bus baby. This is Spoons with Sprues and Spoons, and I'll see you on the next one. Have a wonderful day.